No, you're not having double vision. You do not need to adjust your television. On my workbench, I have two Heathkit signal tracers. The one on the left is a Model T4, and the one on the right is an IT12. The left is from a previous restoration. I did five videos on this particular one. Uh, it has some severe cosmetic problems that I haven't been able to repair. This was notably due to a piece of electrical tape that was used to keep the noise button turned off, which uh, destroyed the unit. Electrically, though, it's absolutely perfect. One other issue is the uh, probe is a little worse for wear on this. I got it working, but it's just a, a little wire. This one, on the other hand, is like absolutely top-notch quality, museum grade. Even the probe is perfect. I mean, the sticker is still in good condition. Uh, electrically, can't tell you because this is going to be another signal tracer restoration video. Another thing I'm going to point out as they sit side from side, they are both from the uh, gray era of Heathkit. However, you can see that the one on the left is the older era, uh, being the T4. It has the older knobs, the different colored gray, uh, the, it has the uh, um, different lettering, everything about it to include the logo up top is the older logo, uh, the writing on the bottom for uh, um, its location in Michigan, all of which was entirely changed in this unit. Back then, they uh, embossed the Heathkit logo onto the handle, and on the uh, uh, newer ones with the black handle, there is no Heathkit logo. And most interesting about this IT-12 is the fact that it may in fact be factory built. A little cosmetic damage only in the rear. Uh, this. Uh, hammer tone is very easy to repair in the back. This is not a big deal at all. That's it. No, no other discrepancies. These two rear screws are a telltale sign that I am not the first person in this unit. Uh, this is the best part. The best part, get this on film. The opening of the box. How bad is it? I gotta get this on camera, of course. Here we go. And there it is. Okay, no horror stories. Let us first evaluate. No water damage, no nightmares, just a cleaning. Good. First look. You all see it first with me. Okay. It's got tubes, selenium, oil there, oil there. Let's see the three twelve eight seven. Looks okay. And this is going to be a 50-50-20 electrolytic capacitor. We already know that this is going to be bad. This can is going to need to be restuffed. And 12 AX7 in here. I hope to God this one is still good. I really do. And a 12 Charlie Alpha 5 beam power tube. This is an RCA. Very nice. And a 1629 Magic Eye tube. Also RCA. 12 AX7. Looking good. Beam power tube. Looking good. 1629 Magic Eye. Looking good. Everything cleaned up really nice now with the original artwork left on. Leaving the feet to soak in deoxid for a while. And while I was at it, every other switch knob and socket was treated with deoxid as well. To include these posts with these jacks. Here, here, and down here as well. Looks like I have the capacitors to do the job. Uh, 250s at 160. And this is a... um. A 20 at 50. Capacitor is desoldered. Time for removal. So truth be told, believe it or not, uh, after running this on the IT11, this particular capacitor and looking at all three capacitors inside, if this thing were brought up really slowly on a Variac, this capacitor probably could have uh, survived in the unit uh, without any rebuild. It seems to be okay on the electrolytic level. Uh, as far as mini-lytic, obviously that's a no-go, but this is not a mini-lytic capacitor. So I, I just wanted to point that out. In consideration that these units are supposed to detect any amount of noise in a system, having substandard filtration is just going to cause all sorts of problems. I got the thing out, I restuff it with brand new capacitors and not deal with it anymore. Just to support my argument, the uh, new capacitors opened up on mini-lytic, <laughs> so that should tell you something. This is 150, so... New capacitor as it is. This cap is now restuffed, tested, and ready to reinstall in the unit. Now I've got the uh, capacitor wired back in. We'll put all the tubes in and we'll bring this up slowly on the Variac and make sure it doesn't explode. 
all the tubes are loaded back up, we're ready to rock and roll. Bring this up slowly on the Variac. If, if people are wondering if this is an express video, I've got a uh, restoration of this already in the exact same process. Like I said, this is a five video series. People can watch, uh, link again above. So I'm gonna bring this up on the Variac. I'm gonna monitor the speaker output here and I'm gonna note any discrepancies going along with that. I'll be shutting off the overhead light for this event. This is a standard Variac turn up. The unit power is, is on and we're going to start dialing it up. We're sitting at 50 volts. We're taking a look. No smoke. Eighty volts. I could start to hear something coming from the speaker. And we see some emanation from the magic eye. This is good. So we're gonna stop it here at 80 volts. No doubt it at full quieting there there is a hum on this device. Uh, a couple things here. Number one, you could see that the tube is the 12 x 7 is microphonic. That's too bad. That's a mullard. That's terrible. But but it is microphone. Or maybe it's just a socket. I don't know. Let me I'm gonna work on that socket a little bit and come back to that. But be that as it may, there, there's I see some noise here. And I I've seen this before. I'm I think I missed that one capacitor that, that goes between the uh preamp and the finals. That one could be leaky. Let's, let's open up the circuit and see if it clears out. If we open up the circuit and it clears out, it's a good indication that that one is leaking voltage. Pull out the 12AX7 from the circuit. See, I, I popped it out. There's the residual on the final. So, yeah, we're going to look at the bottom and take a look. I've determined the outer foil of this capacitor using the oscilloscope, and I've annotated it with the bent side here. I know that it's going to go in the correct direction when I install it. New cap is in. We're going to repeat the procedure. And I'll admit I might be getting a bit hypercritical here because I'm measuring the oscilloscope off of the speaker coil. I'm not measuring it off of some uh, signal output. So, I mean, interference here is could be coming from just about uh, anywhere. That said, there is, there is just the, the slightest hum on the output, right? And that could be, it, it's not due to the capacitors, they're brand new, you know, so, I mean, it could be shielding or, or whatnot, but when I, when I turn up the volume, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it full tilt. The hum doesn't get any louder. It's not, it's not on the amplifier. If you overdrive it, you'll, you'll get a hum feedback like that, but you hear that full tilt. So the problem is uh, insufficient filtration, uh, even using the prescribed amount. Right now, I have a filter on here, an extra 100 microfarads of capacitors off of one of the 50s, and I'm gonna, I got it ramped up so you can see it better. I'm gonna take off that filter now, and there is with the uh, extra filter removed. You see, that's what I'm doing. I got it tied in, right? The filter is removed from, this is the DC, by the way, off the selenium rectifier, and I'm gonna add that filter back. And we can see it's smoothed out. It's minimal, right? As far as the humming, you know, we're talking about little stuff here, but let's see what it looks like on the speaker when I do that. So yeah, of course, this is what we're looking at. This is with the filter, and then I take out the filter and, and the hum gets louder. What we're talking about here is minute. I'm, I'm a little crazy here, you know, and some of this may actually be injected because there's, there's no shielding around the unit. It's laying here open on the table. This might actually improve, but, uh, this is me just getting way ahead of myself again, as I usually do. That never gets old. Finally, to satisfy my curiosity, I've measured the white noise of both of these units side by side. I find that the, the older one is, is slightly marginally quieter. On the oscilloscope, uh, it is like two tiny graticules smaller on the 10 millivolt scale they make the same amount of residual background hum. Here is the left one. Here is the right one. I generally never do this on Heathkit equipment. I try and keep everything OEM. But due to the fact that this has a uh, loudspeaker output and we're seeing problems with the power supply, 
I want to see what happens if I put a modern rectifier diode in here and replace the uh, ancient uh, selenium one. So I'm going to do that now right quick. We're going to see what happens. Here's my incredible botch job. Uh, it's actually quite effective. I have a modern diode. This one's uh, rated to one amp, which is more than sufficient. I think 50 milliamp was the requirement back then. They were very expensive. Today, not so much. This is also a uh, resistor that I've put in. I have measured and computed it and yet forgot the value. I'm not going to touch it to tell you what it is. I don't feel like getting electrocuted today. But I will tell you that the voltage drop um, going across here on DC, I read it about 140. It expects 138. You do have to add a resistor when you switch over to these diodes because it has a different forward voltage drop. Uh, very important when you do that or else you're going to end up with a much higher uh, B plus and you may pull a lot more current through these tubes. I've cleaned up that uh, rectifier installation and now that I've got the noise down to a more manageable level I want to short out that uh, coupling capacitor and see if this clears up. That'll split the circuit into two pieces and tell me where the rest of the hum is coming from. So the effect of grounding the coupling cap can definitely be heard. Here we go. Off. On. Off. On. So whatever is coming from this 12AX7 down to here, if I ground out that signal, everything goes dead quiet. You'll note that even grounded, there is this um, this uh, distortion on the speaker. But you have to remember we're, we're measuring from the speaker here. This is an imperfect measuring point, so we have to allow for some of this. This is about as quiet as you could get something this small with a single diode for a rectifier in, in such a, a small package. So so something interesting here, here's the uh, the residual noise coming out of the speaker, right, with the cables connected to it. And I have my uh, IG72 connected to the unit. It's just plugged in like this. And right now I got the volume turned all the way down. But what's going to happen is this noise is injected so early into the circuit that if I crank up the volume now, we're going to hear the sine wave, or we're going to see the sine wave modulated onto this noise, like AM. Watch this. Slowly turning up the volume. And it is like, like a terrible version of AM. There it is. I can break it out, you know, in the time domain. We could see the sine wave looking all nasty. Right? It's very clean sine wave coming out of the unit, right? So this is just the result of it going through this amplifier. You can see with lower resolution. And there it is. If I turn back the volume, you can see it'll, it'll fall right back to the original noise. Let me take the, uh, the wave out of there. There it is. Just very interesting.